Beast-like creatures, horrific and deformed characters, have been present in films since the early 1900s, and they've evolved drastically throughout the years as audiences' taste and fears changed hand-in-hand with cinema's own evolution of techniques, effects, aesthetic, narratives. In this episode, we're going to look into a genre that opens up a space for a different reality, one that doesn't fit into the boundaries of absolute rationality. And it's in this framework where the figure of the monster sometimes plays a very significant role. Now, obviously, not all movies with monsters in them have a deep meaning. As with everything else, some filmmakers are shooting for entertainment purposes and others delve this into a critical work. If we take a quick look back at the appearance of monsters in pre-modern Europe, we see that their presence in architecture, paintings, wasn't merely entertaining, but educational. Religious beliefs were thoroughly tied to the popular imaginary, and those fears were a reality, in such a way that seeing those elements of fear had a clear intention and effect, which was to be wary of certain behaviors, as well as having a constant reminder of the doctrines that society wanted to feed into you. Memento mori. Hell is a real place that awaits any soul that is not willing to serve God and follow certain social and religious codes. In second place, these symbols of death were a byproduct of the idea, again tied to religious conceptions, that this world and the afterlife were connected or, at the very least, had blurry lines between one another. But three centuries later, with the Enlightenment and Romanticism in between, together with the wars that shaped the past century, We're currently living and have been doing so since the 1800s in a world that industrializes fear, profits from it, and bids for the entertainment more than it does anything else. This is where the mainstream film industry stands. But of course, there are other currents driven by independent filmmakers who explore a different approach to horror, one that's more in touch with the pre-modern treatment of fear we were talking about earlier. Case in point, The Babadook. As pointed out in Vicente Dominguez's Los Dominios del Miedo, when fear reaches a certain intensity, we're placed beyond the walls of rationality, in that sleep of reason from which monsters rise that Goya talked about. In Babadook, an Australian film written and directed by Jennifer Kent, a widowed mother struggles with her son's fear of monsters in his room. The space for a fear of a monster hiding in their home is the night a time when darkness spreads its wings and opens the door to treachery and deceit. Interestingly enough, the boy uses almost these exact words at one point when pretending to be a magician. This conception of the night is a heritage we owe mainly to Baroque, one that most definitely psychological thrillers and horror movies still make use of. In these types of films, the night isn't a time of revelation or wonder. It's a metaphor of darkness, a world of shadows. In a sense, these elements that at first only belong in the night creep into the day for the mother in Babadook, as she starts to lose her sanity. Throughout the majority of the film, this presence is something she struggles to deny and ignore, even when she sees it herself. And so the obvious question is, what is the Babadook? What does it actually represent? And what that thing is, who knows? I know, <laughs> I, feel, I feel what it is, but it's up to the audience to interpret what that is, whether it's supernatural or whether it's psychological, is really up to the viewer. Here's my theory. The monster represents one thing for the son and something different for the mother. For the son, it represents the fear of solitude. For the mother, though, it represents a taboo, a feeling she doesn't allow herself to feel. So what is this taboo? Well, a part of her hates her son. She hates that his birth took her husband's life away. She hates that she has to deal with a conflicted child and has absolutely no time for herself to meet someone and feel what it is to love and be loved again. Admitting that to herself and dealing with it would be too much, and she pushes it down in such a way that, as Jennifer Kent, the director, points out in reference to the Babadook, it develops an energy and becomes something that splits off from her and starts to control her. Nothing in this movie is fortuitous. Even the profession of the deceased father is absolutely meaningful to connect the threads that weave the story together. He was a musician, 
And so his art isn't in the present anymore, but it's still present because music opens rifts in time and it's above the dictates of Saturn, the Roman god of time. Speaking of Saturn, the story's relationship with the myth of Saturn is quite clear just by taking a look at the portrayal of Saturn in art, killing his own sons, an impulse that the Babadook stirs up in the mother. In the end, after the Babadook, that is, the unaccepted trauma, has taken control over her and her son has managed to tie her down until she gets it out, he tells her, I know you don't love me. The Babadook won't let you. And that is the breaking point. The truth is revealed. No, she can't love her own son, not properly, until she gets rid of the melancholy that beats in her blood. And I say melancholy because she vomits a black bile, which etymologically means melancholy and refers to a profound and lagging sadness. According to Ramon Andres in his Dictionary of Music, Mythology, Magic, and Religion, those who suffered this condition were called the sons of Saturn. And so, if we take into consideration another of Goya's famous paintings, Saturn devouring his child, it becomes clear that Saturn, that is, time, devours its child, that is, the future. And so, time eats away the future, rips it from our arms. And melancholy is the longing of the future that could have been. Ramon also points out that the cure that was given to those who suffered from melancholy was music. And the thread brings us back to the husband of the main character in Babadook, of whom all we really know is he was a musician. And so, this black bile, this melancholy tied to the longing of what could have been her life comes out of her mouth, and so does the Babadook. So does the monstrosity that had taken over her because of what she wasn't willing to accept. The movie has many Baroque resonances. First of all, the concept of the night we mentioned at the beginning. Secondly, the literary topic in which, in the event of a lover's death, the woman's soul departs from her and his, the deceased, invades her, almost replacing it. In third place, the falsehood of appearances, symbolized in this film through cockroaches which appear in their kitchen, coming out of a crack on the wall. In fourth place, and lastly, the importance of a name as a means of identity. Samuel has night terrors before finding the book of the Babadook, and all the book really did is make them able to name it. It's hard to tackle something when you can't identify it, and what better way is there to identify than with names? All in all, there's no need to praise one treatment of horror over the other, because there's more than enough room in the industry for both, and they each have something to offer. But it is nice to see there's a tendency to create horror stories that set out to move us, as they demand a deeper look into the psyche of the character to discover the metaphor behind the monster. Because true horror isn't some disgusting, drooling, and growling bizarre creature. True horror isn't even outside. Everything happens inside.